What if Elon Musk never really cared about the moon at all, while the world is focused on NASA's Artemis missions? SpaceX might already be skipping ahead to Mars. And according to recent plans, the first Starship payload could reach the Red Planet as early as 2026. For years, Musk has viewed the moon as little more than a distraction. In his eyes, every move should point toward Mars colonization. Anything else is just noise. That's why every step Starship takes is aligned with its ultimate purpose, even if that means reluctantly joining NASA's geopolitical race through Artemis becoming an independent player that doesn't follow NASA's political rhythm and accepting the criticism for appearing slow. Yes, it may look like a conflict with SpaceX's original mission or even a waste of resources, but in reality, it's a calculated strategy, riding the wave of NASA's budget and power. For those who don't know, in August, SpaceX made a deal with Italy's space agency to send scientific experiments like plants and sensors to Mars on early Starship cargo missions scheduled to begin in late 2026. For many, this move sent a clear message. SpaceX isn't just talking about Mars colonization anymore. It's officially launching its commercial Mars services and is determined to reach the Red Planet as soon as possible. Sending equipment in this case helps SpaceX learn how to survive and build a future on the Red Planet. This mission also stands in sharp contrast to the now-canceled Dear Moon Project, a 2018 private trip around the moon funded by a Japanese billionaire. That mission offered little in terms of real progress toward lunar colonization. This difference further highlights the fact that Elon is pushing Mars colonization so much harder than settling the moon. So why? Well, the answer starts with survival. SpaceX's big-picture goal is to give humanity a backup home somewhere far enough away to stay safe, even if Earth faces a global disaster like nuclear war or civilization collapse. The Moon It's too close. If something catastrophic happens on Earth, the Moon could be affected too. And honestly, living on the Moon is much tougher than most people think. The worst problem there isn't just the lack of air, it's the dust. Lunar dust is sharper and more abrasive than anything on Mars because it's never been weathered by wind or water. Imagine ultra-sharp asbestos that sticks to everything. It clings to spacesuits, scratches equipment, and when astronauts walk back inside, it rides along with them. During Apollo missions, astronauts said the dust even got under their skin and fingernails for months afterward. Imagine what breathing that over time could do to the lungs. Then there's the radiation. The moon has no atmosphere, and it's closer to the sun than Mars, so the surface gets blasted by solar radiation. That means electronics degrade faster, and people would need thick, heavy shielding to survive. And let's not forget the extreme temperature swings. The moon's day and night cycle lasts 28 Earth days. For two weeks, it's scorching hot up to 127 degrees Celsius. Then it flips to two weeks of freezing cold, dropping to minus 173 degrees. On Mars, one day lasts about 24 hours. And while it's cold, there too, temperatures are more stable, averaging around minus 60 degrees with some warm spots near the equator. Those long lunar nights are a nightmare for the power supply. You'd need massive batteries or nuclear reactors just to keep things running. And if Earth ever stopped sending supplies, a lunar base couldn't survive for long. The moon simply doesn't have enough of the ingredients needed for life carbon nitrogen or even enough carbon dioxide to make rocket fuel. Sure, there's ice at the poles, but not nearly enough carbon compounds. That's a deal breaker for long-term sustainability. Mars, on the other hand, has a thin but carbon dioxide rich atmosphere and frozen water beneath its surface. That means you can make methane and oxygen right there exactly what Starship needs to refuel and what humans need to breathe. 
This argument ties directly to Musk's opposition to the idea of using lunar resources to refuel Mars-bound missions. There's been a debate for years about whether it makes sense to stop on the moon extract liquid oxygen from lunar soil and use it to refuel rockets headed for Mars. Musk and many aerospace experts argue that it's simply not practical. The physics don't add up. Stopping on the moon for refueling would require almost the same amount of fuel as just going straight to Mars. Because the moon has no atmosphere, any spacecraft landing there would need to rely entirely on rocket power burning extra fuel for both landing and takeoff. Mars, on the other hand, has a thin atmosphere that allows for aerobraking using the air to slow down instead of engines. That simple difference means a mission from low Earth orbit to the Martian surface actually requires less delta V, or total energy, than a trip to the lunar surface and back. Imagine trying to build a self-sufficient home on the moon. It's like setting up camp on a tiny dust-choked beach where the ground cuts your boots, the air doesn't exist, and temperatures swing from burning hot to bone-freezing cold every few weeks. Mars, while far from friendly, is more forgiving a vast, empty desert with thin air and frozen water beneath the surface. There's at least something to work with. That's why Musk gets frustrated when Congress and NASA keep pouring resources into lunar programs, racing to beat China to the moon or planning to build permanent bases there. From his point of view, the obsession with lunar fuel production misses the bigger picture. Why chase limited resources on the moon when Mars already has what we need, carbon nitrogen ice, and the ingredients to make rocket fuel and sustain life? And there's another risk. If too much time and money are locked into moon projects, it could delay progress toward Mars. A drawn-out lunar phase could drain funding stall development and leave the Mars dream waiting on the launch pad. On the other hand, this also raises a hot question. If Musk truly sees the moon as a distraction, then why is SpaceX spending billions building the Starship Lunar Lander? The answer lies in how SpaceX plays the long game. While the two, $9 billion contract from NASA is a big deal, the company has said it covers only a fraction of what it will actually spend. Those payments are milestone-based, meaning SpaceX only gets paid after hitting specific goals. So clearly, there's more to this than chasing NASA's money. That's a way to get paid while learning the hard lessons required for Mars colonization, like perfecting in-orbit refueling precision landing and sustainable habitats. At this point, the Moon becomes what Musk might call a useful distraction, some argue that politically, voters might not support the U.S. government funding a multi-billion dollar Mars effort, but lower-cost lunar missions within NASA's existing budget are more likely to be favored. This makes using NASA's budget for lunar missions a pragmatic option for funding Starship development. So SpaceX doesn't have to choose between the Moon and Mars. It can use the moon journey as a fully funded real-world testing ground for the ultimate destination. Many engineers agree that the moon could be the perfect place for research and development. It's harsh enough to push technology to its limits, but close enough for rescue operations if things go wrong. That proximity makes it the ideal training ground before committing to a full-scale Mars mission. The real advantage isn't just distance, it's iteration speed. Building a base beyond Earth means solving countless unexpected problems. The faster you can test, fail, and fix, the faster you progress. Let's break it down. Travel time to the Moon is about three days while Mars takes six to nine months. Communication delay. Roughly three seconds for the Moon, but anywhere from 8 to 40 minutes for Mars. Launch windows. You can go to the Moon almost any time, but to Mars you only get a good chance every 26 months. That difference changes everything. On the Moon, you can test a mining robot, see what breaks, 
and send an improved version within weeks. It's an agile, fast learning process. Mars, however, forces a slow, waterfall-style approach. You must plan everything years in advance. And if something fails, it could take more than two years to send a fix. The Moon also offers something that's often overlooked. It's the perfect place to prepare astronauts for the kind of environment they'll face on Mars. Both worlds have low gravity, about one-sixth of Earth's gravity on the Moon, and one-third on Mars, so lunar missions can help train crews to live and work in reduced gravity far better than anything possible on a space station where astronauts experience almost complete weightlessness. But there's a catch, a trap SpaceX must avoid. That trap is redesigning Starship too much to fit the Moon's specific needs, and in doing so, making it useless for Mars. It's exactly what happened during Apollo. Those rockets and landers were incredible for their time, but they were built for one goal, only short trips to the Moon. A few astronauts, a few days, then everything was discarded. Once the Moon race ended, the technology hit a dead end. If Starship followed that same path built as a lightweight, single-use lunar lander, it could save costs in the short term, but fail in the long run. Imagine stripping away the heat shield and flaps so it can't survive Mars entry using propellants that can't be made on Mars or removing the ability to return and be reused. That version might make sense for Artemis, but it would be worthless for the Mars mission that SpaceX was founded to pursue. SpaceX seems determined not to repeat Apollo's mistake. That's why it continues to build and refine a single versatile Starship system, one designed first and foremost for Mars, but adaptable enough for the Moon. Even though that makes it look overbuilt for Artemis, it's a deliberate choice. Developing this kind of all-purpose reusable ship takes time and extensive testing, which is why progress on Artemis III often appears slow. Critics see delays, but in reality, these long test cycles are what make the system safer and more capable. Every lunar milestone doubles as a Mars readiness test. NASA gets its lander for Artemis, while SpaceX gets to validate the technologies it will rely on to reach Mars.